All right, everybody, and hello, Sir John. Um, I am very excited today. I'm Stevie Jace, um, one of the uh, leadership team members this year. And today we have an awesome talk by Dr. Kelly Wright. Um, she is a Harvard tr a fellowship trained minimally invasive gynecologic surgeon promoting innovative, safe, and cost-effective treatment options for women. She has worked as a physician champion on hospital committees regarding ERAS, uh, patient safety and cost optimization, and has extensive teaching and mentoring experience of other colleagues, fellows, residents, medical students. Um, she currently serves as the division director of minimally invasive gynecologic surgery at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles and is leading a busy and productive team of world-renowned surgeons. In addition to her clinical and leadership roles, Dr. Wright enjoys using her background in biomedical engineering as an industry-leading consultant for medical device companies. And today, she's here to talk to us about endometriosis for the colorectal surgeon. Great. Right. Well, thank you so much for having me today. And just want to confirm once more you can hear me. Yep. Perfect. All right. Great. So, um, and thank you so much for your interest in this topic. I'm really glad to talk to our other pelvic surgery colleagues about this topic, this endometriosis that I feel like the more I do this, the longer I do this, the more I don't know. And it can be a rather unsatisfying condition to treat both medically and surgically. I think I compare it a lot to Crohn's in your field. Um, where we see just a lot of variation in patient outcomes. But what I'll share with you today is a little bit of what we do know, a little bit where um, chronic pelvic pain comes in because we do have a lot of overlapping conditions which can cause chronic pain. And then at the end, I have some surgical videos we can go through um, to talk about how we can optimize endometriosis removal in the pelvis, including on the bowel. Uh, so these are my disclosures. And again, these are the objectives for today. And once more, thank you for your interest in this disease. And endometriosis, the official definition is endometrial light glands and stroma that are at extrauterine or ectopic sites. Um, this is a very classic appearing, what we call powder burn lesion of endometriosis, which will have stroma glands and also some fibrotic contracture that you can see of the peritoneum, which is a, a common place for it to be found. Um, and then when you look at the histology of endometriosis, it very much mimics eutopic endometrium, where the eutopic endometrium is on the left here, and the ectopic endometriosis lesion is on the right. And so you really want to work with pathologists who understand what endometriosis is defined as. And some of our pathologists will even define endometriosis as being present when they see the stroma only, uh, knowing that some lesions are so fibrotic that they actually burn out the glandular component, and then the residual stroma is just left behind. Um, but what really is endometriosis, and how can it all be one disease? Everything from, you know, microscopic peritoneal disease that you see here at the top left, to chronic pelvic pain and multiple functional somatic syndromes, which you can see all over the body, to things like ovarian endometriosis, where you get the classic kissing ovaries that come together complete obliteration of the anatomy and the cul-de-sacs, or then even isolated deep endometriosis lesions that can appear on the bowel. And I think the thing we're learning about endometriosis is that it can't be all one disease. It's probably multiple different phenotypes of a condition that we've, we've lumped together. Um, but something that, that our group has really worked on is trying to figure out exactly what is in an endometriosis lesion and how do these things differ between patients. This is a really nice review put out by the New England Journal a couple years ago on endometriosis. It really goes through the entire continuum of, of what we know. And the theories for why endometriosis happens, it still really hasn't been worked out very well. Um, we've all heard of the retrograde menstruation theory, which I'll get into, but it's probably much more complicated than that. And there's probably components of things like metaplasia, cell metastasis. metastasis um, and likely altered uh, cellular immunity as well. The retrograde menstruation theory actually came from 1927 from Sampson, who was a GYN surgeon. He um, is you know, credited with discovering endometriosis basically in girls who had obstructive GYN anomalies and noted that they had a high rate 
of endometriosis. But the second part of his theory was actually that if you corrected the obstructive anomaly, that it caused resolution of endometriosis. And while this might actually happen in mice models, this does not happen in humans. Unfortunately, having uh, an intact outflow tract does not prevent endometriosis. So if there is a component of retrograde menstruation contributing to endometriosis, there has to be much more when it comes to cellular immunity. There has to be some kind of implantation or dysregulated cells that are in the peritoneum that are allowed to stick around. And then there's actually increased um, angiogenesis and the creation of neurovascular bundles around endometriosis lesions. And also 90% of women have retrograde menstruation and actually retrograde menstruation can cause a lot of hemosiderin staining in the pelvis. So it can actually look like endometriosis but not actually be an implant. And it is something that can resolve with, with cleaning. Um, a couple of studies that have disproven this theory over the years were the finding of endometriosis in premenarchal girls who had chronic pelvic pain, um, who didn't have any kind of obstructive anomaly, hadn't even gone through menarche yet, and were found to have lesions of endometriosis in their pelvis. And then it's also been found in patients without a uterus, uh, patients with MRKH syndrome, where they have uterine and sometimes vaginal agenesis, have been found to have endometriosis. It's even been found in cisgender males as well. So again, we know that there's some kind of um, cellular transformation and probably some immune dysregulation that's going on when it comes to the formation of endometriosis. And that has to allow implantation, again, allow recruitment of these neurovascular bundles. And then there's still a lot of questions around what allows distant site um, metastasis. We have seen endometriosis in the thorax and the central nervous system. Um, and if you ever see patients with catamenial pneumothoraces or a pneumothorax that lines up with their period and tends to be recurrent, we'll often see endometriosis lesions, not only on the diaphragm, but they can be on the pleura and on the lung uh, tissue itself. And again, this, um, this figure here comes from that New England Journal article. And what they find, um, or what they think happens with endometriosis lesions is that they're very macrophage enriched, um, which then leads to the implantation, cellular adhesion and proliferation, the increase of VEGF and the neurovascular bundles that come along. And it has actually reduced natural killer cell activity and also exhausted T cell activity, which is similar to a lot of cancers and immune conditions. So this has to be um, further studied. Our group actually had a paper published in Nature Genetics earlier this year where we published the first cellular atlas of endometriosis where we took patients and our um, really smart PI performed single cell DNA sequencing on the lesions, basically to find out what is in a lesion. And as you can see down here, there are lots of fibroblasts, which makes sense since the lesions can be very contractile on the peritoneum, but there's also things like smooth muscle cells, some red blood cells, and then mast cells. And you can see that these natural killer cells and T cells to a much lower extent. Um, but lots going on here and, and a lot more to find out when it comes to um, fully you know, finding out where endometriosis comes from. And what's interesting is the location of endometriosis and the depth of invasion actually have a lot of different cell types. So the purple is uh, the dark purple are endometrioma, which is ovarian endometriosis, has many different cellular types than the green, the light green, which is peritoneal endometriosis. So these are probably different disease, diseases. Um, and then we also divide endometriosis into superficial and deep, meaning how far does it invade into a tissue or a visceral organ versus is it on the surface and growing outwardly. But actually surgeons uh, are pretty bad at telling apart deep and superficial. This is myself and my partner. And then there was even worse concordance when it comes to pathologic or histologic diagnosis of actually how deep the lesion goes. Uh, and so this really lends us to the recommendation that if you see a lesion, it really needs to be excised and biopsied so that you can figure out exactly what it is and exactly how deep it goes. We know that endometriosis has a familial tendency, and if somebody has a first degree uh, relative with endometriosis, then they have a seven um, fold higher risk of having endometriosis, and that we're seeing some polymorphism in the KRAS gene, which is a gene that is implicated in cancers and relates to self proliferation. 
And um, endometriomas, ovarian endometriosis, again, um, probably represents somewhat of a, a different disease than peritoneal endometriosis and actually confers a different cancer risk. Uh, so this was a study looking at patients who had endometriomas of, that were removed, how many recurred, and then what was the resulting risk of ovarian cancer afterwards. These were actually patients in their 40s, and this ovarian cancer risk is actually double the baseline population. But what's really interesting is that the baseline population risk of ovarian cancer is almost exclusively serous epithelial ovarian cancer, um, which is not implicated in increased risk with any kind of endometriosis. However, ovarian endometriomas had a really significantly increased risk of developing clear cell um, ovarian cancer, which is a very aggressive, very rare uh, form of the disease. And so for these patients, not only are we counseling in regards to removing endometriosis for symptomatic relief and for fertility reasons, but also for cancer reasons down the road. Um, so these are things that we don't just want to leave alone and, you know, continue to watch for a long time. So how common is endometriosis? Well, we find it in about 10% of women undergoing GYN surgery. We find it in up to 30% of women undergoing surgery for pelvic pain. And if you do a good job of actually triaging patients like we try to in our practice, um, though we are a referral center, we see it in up to about 80% of our patients who are undergoing surgery for pelvic pain. And then up to 50% of women um, who are undergoing surgery for infertility. As far as making the diagnosis, endometriosis can pre present very early on in adolescent women, um, particularly those with cyclical pelvic pain who don't respond to medical management. And this was just a small study looking at patients uh, who were adolescents who were placed on NSAIDs or oral contraceptive pills uh, for several months who didn't respond. And they actually had a high rate of endometriosis when they went to surgery. But, one of the problems with diagnosing endometriosis is that we currently don't have any biomarkers. It's hard to pick up per peritoneal disease on any type of imaging. And so most patients have to undergo uh, diagnostic surgery to actually even find out if they have endometriosis, which again is very unsatisfying when you're trying to treat somebody's pain. Because of this um, you know, pretty extreme level of intervention needed to make the diagnosis, you can imagine this leads to diagnostic delays. Uh, it's been reported in other countries, a median of seven years. In our country, about four years. And it's the fastest for patients who are undergoing treatments for infertility, but it's very long for patients who are adolescents. And so as you can imagine, if patients do have pain with their cycles and they have this repeated trigger of pain over and over and over, how that could lead to chronic pelvic pain and issues down the road, uh, not only with quality of life, but also fertility issues. And so that leads me in just to a little section about chronic pelvic pain, which I think is where our fields overlap a lot because we actually see a lot of patients who have Crohn's and ulcerative colitis because they're being sent to see if they have endometriosis. But I think um, what overlaps here is simply the sensitization of organs in the pelvis. And um, we, we, especially in our lab, are really trying to separate chronic pelvic pain as a condition versus endometriosis as a separate condition, whereas previously for research purposes, they've always been lumped together. Um, whereas endometriosis can be a trigger for developing chronic pelvic pain, chronic pelvic pain itself, and especially in the absence of endometriosis, can be a functional somatic syndrome. Our colleagues at Michigan have done a lot of work in this space, and the chronic pelvic pain uh, with functional brain imaging and very, very interesting. So in this study, they took patients and they used this algometer um, to put pressure on their arm to measure their pain thresholds. And they took patients who had chronic pain both with and without confirmed endometriosis and then those who had no pain with and without endometriosis. And you can imagine you know, who responded uh, worse to the pain thresholds. And that was the patients with chronic pain, not necessarily the patients just with endometriosis. And this is where we say that um, it's classically said that stage of endometriosis and pain have not been highly correlated. As you can see, that pain thresholds were pretty constant across the board, whether a patient had no endometriosis at stage zero versus stage four. Uh, and just a comment about stage, um, you may have heard about endometriosis stages before. It's really loosely defined 
uh, way to describe how much disease is in the pelvis, where stage one is typically isolated lesions on the peritoneum, uh, all the way to stage four, where you can have complete obliteration of the cul-de-sacs and the organs. So just keep that in mind as we go through, but we don't find stage very useful except for a communication system uh, to other surgeons. And so we spend a lot of time counseling our patients ab about um, central sensitization and pain and what that can look like for their recovery from surgery. So we know that we have nociceptive and visceral inflammatory pain that can come from cycles, come from endometriosis, come from other organs um, versus neuropathic pain, which can be peripheral or central. And how we to describe it to patients is that they basically get sensitized over time. So these, they're bad periods for 20 years that nobody has ever managed, the inflammatory process that happens to them twice a month, both at the time of ovulation and at the time of menstruation, basically creates peripheral sensitization, which can then lead to central sensitization, which of course is affected by central factors like stress, um, and then leads to visceral visceral sensitization or what we describe as organ crosstalk. This is why patients can have diarrhea or constipation on their periods, even in the absence of other disease, um, and which can then lead to visceral somatic sensitization. And I think when we describe it to patients like this, like it's actually not in your head, it started as a peripheral trigger, which has then progressed to this chronic pain syndrome. Patients are a lot more accepting of, of this type of pain disease as opposed to if, you know, thinking that uh, they're just imagining it. And we talked to them about you know, the endometriosis or even regular cycles can turn up the pain volume from what they experience. And that can make everything that they go through from day-to-day -day life, movement, and normal bowel and bladder function also extremely painful. And again, our, our um, colleagues at University of Michigan have shown that um, endometriosis and, and peripheral pain actually does change the brain anatomy. So in patients who had uh, chronic pelvic pain on functional MRI were shown to have decreased gray matter in pain regulatory areas. And they were also shown to have increased levels of excitatory neurotransmitter. So again, it's not all in their head. These are physiologic changes, which are leading to chronic pain syndromes. And once patients get into central sensitization, they're less likely to respond to these peripheral directed therapies, things like hormonal suppression of their periods. What they really need is multidisciplinary care. Um, and they also are less likely to experience good outcomes after surgery. This is where things like prehab for us can come in really helpful if somebody's extremely deconditioned from their pain um, before we take them to surgery. Uh, we have the opportunity to re really get them in a better place so that they will benefit from the excision of endometriosis uh, rather than just having it lead to another pain trigger, which worsens their quality of life. And I tell patients all the time that I don't have to give them another diagnosis for them to have effects in other organs. Of course, we want to rule out these things, but I can also treat the pain that is associated with these organs um, without having to blame it on another disease process. And I'll say that almost all of our patients who have endometriosis or have a suspicion of endometriosis, they go to surgery for their diagnosis and excision. They get some kind of hormonal suppression um, for their cycles if they're not actively trying to get pregnant. And almost all of them are going into pelvic floor physical therapy as well. Uh, maybe they'll be using muscle relaxants or sometimes even things like Botox injections or pudendal nerve blocks because we're trying to break that cycle of that visceral somatic sensitization. Um, there's not a magic bullet for every single patient. You all probably know this as well. Uh, and so I do tell patients that it is frustrating, um, but it is trial and error. And so we will go through different things uh, based on their specific symptoms and what they're specifically trying to, to treat and what their tolerances are. Uh, and for chronic pelvic pain in general, we found a lot of success in particular with the amitriptyline, the 10 milligram dose, which is labeled as Elevil, uh, especially for daily pain when it seems to be related to central sensitization. In our patients in particular, because GYN pain is very inflammatory and muscular-based, opioids don't tend to make it better for them. And so instead we see patients, uh, they get into a cycle, they get constipated um, and it can make it worse. So we really try to avoid that for long-term management in general for our patients. And so, 
This really leads to our multifactorial approach to evaluating patients' pain, being honest with them about findings, um, and focusing on improvement rather than cure. Again, our disease is still at a very early stage of understanding where it can be really unsatisfying to treat people. And we're very clear about what can be helped by what we can do and what's not likely to be, and the other areas of treatment that we need to go forth. And I think patients are, again, very receptive to that when you describe it in that way. Um, there can also be some value in negative findings in diagnostic surgery. Nobody wants to go through surgery and learn that they don't have anything structural or physical there that's causing their pain. But I, um, again, try to describe that it's not that they're not having pain, but it's not necessarily endometriosis as the trigger of that pain. And typically things like serial removal of organs is not helpful for helping chronic pelvic pain unless the disease is a component of those organs. So we do see endometriosis of the uterus, that's adenomyosis, and then of course the endometriomas of the ovaries, um, which in, in some cases do warrant removal of the organs. So let's move into talking about surgery. I'll start with peritoneal endometriosis. Uh, since you all operate in the pelvis, you probably see stuff like this all the time. So peritoneal endometriosis, typically we consider stage one disease. And interestingly, uh, does not tend to localize well to symptoms. So somebody might describe that their pain is typically on the right, but they have all of their peritoneal endometriosis on the left. So it seems to be more of that visceral inflammatory response that they're feeling in the pelvis. Um, however, there is a clear benefit to surgical treatment and a Cochrane review was shown that excision surgery, so actually removing the lesion uh, was really helpful for pain outcomes at one year. Uh, however, unfortunately, these pain outcomes don't tend to last long term and up to 50% of patients will undergo surgery within the next decade. That's where uh, medical management can really come in where we try to prevent recurrence and reduce symptoms related to cycles. However, we have responders to medical management and we have non-responders. Again, that probably is related to the differences in the disease that we're seeing, but haven't elucidated yet. And um, excision, again, the removal of the lesion is thought to be better than ablation or just the burning or destruction of the lesion, which was done for a long time. One, again, to prevent recurrence, um, most importantly, to get a histologic diagnosis since these lesions can fool us. And also the uh, tip of the iceberg phenomenon. So seeing that the surgeon concordance with the pathologic diagnosis was very much all over the place. We're very bad at telling how deep these lesions go. And by excising the full peritoneum and looking for the healthy tissue underneath, you can make sure that you get the disease. So if you're in a surgery and you see something like this, you don't feel the need to have to strip out their entire peritoneum, but certainly if you saw a lesion, you could pick it up and excise that peritoneal area and at least get them a diagnosis that they may wanna have a consult with us later on. Ovarian endometriosis or endometriomas, which I mentioned before, which we take a little bit more seriously. Endometriomas are actually not a true cyst of the ovary. It's an invagination of the ovarian cortex. So it's thought that the lesion starts on the cortex and then as the ovary goes through transformation, ovulation, that tissue is invaginated and then continues to proliferate and grow into a cyst. Uh, these cysts then create a very fibrotic, basically capsule around the cyst, the chocolate cyst. And, uh, and that's what we are attempting to remove when it comes to surgery. You can pretty well see these on ultrasound. They, this is one area of endometriosis where we can pretty well hang our hat on it ahead of time and say, yeah, this is something that you have. You can see this ground glass, very layered appearance on the ultrasound. Uh, sometimes it can be confused with mucinous cystadenomas or dermoid cysts, which have that mucin component, but those tend to be a little bit more echogenic with a little bit more reflection on, in the mucin. And this is very much this kind of grayscale appearance. You can compare this to something like a hemorrhagic cyst, which comes naturally as a result of a follicle rupture that then bleeds into itself. A hemorrhagic cyst will bleed into itself, but then will form a clot. So it can look more heterogeneous 
And these things tend to resolve over six to eight weeks. So forever ensure we can repeat their ultrasound six to eight weeks later and see if the cyst is still there. The important thing to know about endometriomas is that it's associated with severe endometriosis up to 50% of the time. Uh, so when we see this on ultrasound, especially bilateral, we are looking for severe endometriosis and usually obliteration of the cul-de-sacs. Uh, and I'll just say too that ultrasound is a bit better at diagnosing these than MRI. Uh, however, that's not the case for other types of endometriosis, which I'll go over in a couple of slides. Uh, this is a picture here where you can see the uterus, but the ovary with the endometrium is completely retroperitonealized. You can see the tube here, which is pretty damaged. It's, it's pretty inflated, and then there's really no uh, ovary or adnexa here. So sometimes these things do become retroperitonealized, and that can cause a lot of pain for patients. Typically, we'll remove them surgically when their pain isn't controlled medically or when their size meets certain cutoffs by our fertility organizations, that's three to four centimeters. Sometimes we'll remove them to optimize IVF outcomes if the endometriosis uh, fluid is in the way of an egg retrieval, it can actually ruin the quality of the eggs that are retrieved. And so we'll work with fertility doctors who often ask us to remove these. Um, Sometimes risk of torsion, these things really don't torse since they're highly associated with severe disease. They tend to be very stuck to other organs. And then we also wanna get that pathologic diagnosis and then cancer prevention. So I'm telling patients, we typically wanna monitor their ovaries. There's no set schedule, but sometime before they go through menopause and make sure there's no recurrent endometrioma cysts. And if there is, we wanna take their ovary out. When it comes to removing these, uh, removal of the cyst wall or the fibrotic capsule is preferred over drainage. Drainage might uh, give a really temporary relief if these patients are in acute pain, but typically these are gonna come back very quickly if you don't remove at least a portion of the cyst wall. Um, because the cyst wall, again, is a fibrotic invagination of the cortex, that's also where the follicles sit. And so by removing this in a very aggressive manner, we can really, really decrease a patient's fertility if we're too aggressive or we use too much energy. So when we're trying to remove these, we'll often use hemostatic agents like vasopressin or uh, flow seal or other uh, hemostatic agents, as, as well as suturing of the ovarian cortex, uh, not only to allow for healing, but also to lift the ovary off of the underlying tissues since they tend to be stuck underneath. Here you can see this endometrioma that's been removed. This is cortex that's being sutured together. And you could see this um, where the peritoneum has been completely removed because the cortex was very, very stuck and that plane was completely obliterated. But endometriomas really represent a, a hard fertility question. Patients who have endometriomas have a lower anti-mullerian hormone, which conveys to us the basically fertility potential or ovarian reserve potential of somebody who would go through fertility treatments. And we know that those are 45% lower in patients with endometriomas than the general population. We also know that going in and operating on the ovary has the potential to further reduce the AMH. So in these patients, if they are interested in fertility, we'll usually have them have a consult with an infertility physician uh, before we go about removal because we want to do the right thing. And sometimes a patient may decide to undergo an egg freezing or egg retrieval prior to endometrioma removal. It's not just for fertility as well, but it's also for menopause because a really aggressive stripping of these cysts can actually, uh, especially if they're on both sides, can put somebody into premature ovarian failure or early menopause. So we want to be really uh, sensitive to that as well. Moving on uh, from the ovary to other areas of endometriosis. So we actually find it on the appendix a lot. In a cohort of 400 patients who are undergoing surgery for endometriosis, even with stage one disease, they're finding it on the appendix about 10% of the time. And then with other severe, deeply infiltrating disease, about 40% of the time. And it can even be microscopic and, and fairly normal appearing. So what I counsel patients is, um, you know, I'll take a, a good look at the appendix and if it seems like endometriosis is on it, I'll usually remove the appendix at the same time. It's also been helpful for diagnosing other causes of chronic pelvic pain, 
I've had some pathology results come back with acute or chronic appendicitis and also carcinoid tumors. I think I've taken out about 10 in my career uh, at this point, uh, simply because we were going in for endometriosis and the appendix looked a little bit funny. So uh, we have a very low threshold to do this. We typically just do it through fives uh, with a couple of endo loops because the appendix we're taking out is usually not as severely affected as something that you all would be taking out. And then in regards to deep infiltrating endometriosis, so we can see nodular invasion of endometriosis into other organs, not just the GYN organs, but also into the bowel or bladder. So of course, with bowel disease, we'll often see dyskesia or hematochesia. If I have a patient who has cyclical hematochesia corresponding with their periods and they're sure that it's not menstrual blood, then I'll usually have them get a colonoscopy beforehand to look for a full thickness lesion of endometriosis prior to undergoing surgery. And then we usually get MRIs as well because MRIs are very good at picking up nodular endometriosis in non-GYN organs. Uh, for patients who have dysuria or again, cyclical hematuria, we look for uh, bladder nodules. Oftentimes with things like dyspareunia, we can see obliterative posterior cul-de-sac disease. And then sometimes these things can implant in the abdominal wall as well. We'll see them implant in trocar sites or at the umbilicus, even de novo, de novo if they've never had surgery before or some patients in their C-section scar as well. And the, for that, for planning for that, I usually get an MRI as well. And then occasionally we will see invasion into the ureters as well. It's more common to have extrinsic ureteral compression from endometriosis and space occupying lesions as opposed to an intrinsic lesion that invades into the ureteral mucosa, but it is something to look out for. It's also very rare to have bowel obstruction from endometriosis, but we have had patients who've had both large bowel obstruction and small bowel obstruction with typically something like this, the, the transition point where a loop of small bowel is stuck. So it can be a pretty nefarious disease. When it comes to bowel endometriosis in particular, what's the best way to image? Well, Vaginal ultrasound can be okay. And if you have an experienced sonographer, it can be quite good at picking up pure rectovaginal nodules, but anything higher is going to be missed. And so usually we don't rely on vaginal ultrasound alone when we're looking for a nodule of endometriosis. There are of course, um, you know, uh, transvaginal ultrasound with, with rectal water contrast or putting somebody to sleep and doing an endoscopy with a, um, ultrasound on the end. And outside of that, you know, we really just go for the MRI because it can not only look for lesions much higher up and doesn't require anesthesia, but it can also give us a sense of, of organ involvement when it comes to the bladder, the, the um, uterus, the bowel, and then also if there's anything deeper in the pelvis, even down to the sciatic nerves. So we'll typically do uh, MRI of the pelvis with and without contrast when we are concerned. And so what to do about bowel endometriosis? It's also another area where surgery alone can sometimes be really unsatisfying. And sometimes hormonal suppression is the way to go for patients, even when we know they have bowel endometriosis. Um, so it's it, hormonal suppression has been studied that it's shown to significantly improve pain when bowel stenosis is like than 60%. So a, a smaller size nodule, that's for both combined oral contraceptive and for low dose progestins alone, things like agestin or norethindrone, which is a continuous use progesterone, which can pretty much be used by uh, any patient with any health condition outside of breast cancer. Those can be really nice and suppressive for endometriosis. And it's not only that the nodule of endometriosis is be likely to be suppressed by the hormones, but they also get the suppression of their cycles, which can convey symptoms to the bowel, even you know, in the absence of bowel endometriosis. So we can always start with hormonal management. In 40 patients who had deep infiltrating endo on the bowel who were treated with hormones, uh, over half had significant improvement in symptoms, and then about a third of those patients opted to have surgery due to continued symptoms. And so when it comes to surgery, what do we do? There's a lot of debate in our field over what is the best type of surgery for bowel nodules. And I think it really depends on 
how large the nodule is, where the nodule is located, and what we are attempting to achieve. Most of the time, if we can, we're going to go with something simple like a shaving excision where we actually stay above the muscularis or simply shaving off the, the peritoneum and maybe the serosa and the endometriosis disease and then reinforcing that. For nodules that go all the way through that are small, we can consider disc, disc excision, which is full thickness excision of a portion of the bowel. Um, for multifocal nodule, nodular disease, you could consider a segmental resection. Of course, there are concerns that might be more morbid. And then a really neat technique that I've seen with the circular staple stapler before, which we call the dental floss technique for small lesions where you can actually put a stitch through the lesion, uh, hold it down into the circular stapler and uh, have that small portion removed, kind of like a disc, disc excision, uh, but maybe a little more feasible. And I'll show you a video of that. In uh, meta-analysis, looking at outcomes, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of good outcomes data uh, for patients. But there were uh, very few findings that were different between things like disc excision and shaving versus segmental resection. And what you can see here are things like constipation and frequent bowel movements favored the disc excision or shaving a little bit. Um, not hugely, but the other effects, things like pain and things like incontinence, complications, or even long-term quality of life outcomes did not differ between the surgical approaches. Uh, so while we may think segmental resection is a little bit more complicated, might lead to more complications in these limited studies, it hasn't been shown to do so. And so what do our experts typically recommend? Well, if there's a lesion that's found incidentally and the patient's asymptomatic, perhaps do some shaving and do a biopsy to get them a diagnosis and then discuss options afterwards and really try to define what symptoms they're experiencing and how that can be helped. Because again, we can always start with hormonal management for these patients. For lesions above the sigmoid colon, especially on the right side or the ileocecal area where those can be common, um, seg segmental resection you know, seems reasonable and, and feasible, and a lot of times uh, that can be done for those lesions. For lesions that are on the sigmoid, you can make a decision between shaving or disc excision based on the size. So if there's a lesion that's less than three centimeters and less than 50% of the lumen, probably the more conservative aspect is preferred versus if there are many lesions along the sigmoid or there's, some, I've seen, even seen like an 11 centimeter lesion on the sigmoid, of course, a segmental resection would be preferred. And then for lesions before the sigmoid, probably more conservative is preferred just based on the high rate of complications, the high rate of fistula formation in this area. And then again, the lack of, of good long-term outcomes when it uh, comes to patients with very low lesions and very low disease. So I'm gonna move on to some videos now, but just in summary, think about endometriosis like different diseases based on the severity and also based on the location of the lesions and, and treat it as such. And then for patients with chronic pelvic pain, really set expectations for um, you know, what we can achieve with the management that we have now versus how we can improve their quality of life. And it's not necessarily by giving them another diagnosis and then balance the medical and surgical management for symptom control. So I'm gonna just stop sharing here because I always think videos do a little bit better on Zoom when they are directly shared. So let me start with a stage four endometriosis in a patient who wanted organ conservation. So she wanted to keep her uterus and ovaries. And we knew that she had some pretty severe endometriosis. And so this is her MRI here. Uh, this is her uterus. And you can see that this is her uh, basically rectosigmoid junction. And you can see there's, there's no clear plane there. And I'll show you the axial view as well. So that's our sagittal T2, which is really helpful for looking at GYN organs. 
and then the axial T2, which you can see again, no difference in the plane between the lower part of the uterus. And so this is what it looked like on laparoscopy. So we can see the posterior cul-de-sac, it's, it's pretty open, but we can see the uh, rectosigmoid junction here. And so in endometriosis, um, things can get very fibrotic, as I've mentioned, and things tend to be pulled very medially. So the ureters, the rectum, the uterus sacral, everything can become obliterated and get pulled very medially. So when I'm dealing with uh, rectal lesions or rectovaginal lesions or posterior cul-de-sac lesions, I always wanna dissect out the ureters first and make sure that it's fully lateralized away from, from what I'm working on. And so you can see the ureter over here. And basically this is a fibrotic uterosacral ligament here, which I'm gonna take down. Um, doing this does not uh, put somebody at risk for pelvic organ prolapse later on. Their disease is fibrotic in the uterosacral ligament. And so by opening this up, it's actually gonna give me access uh, to the normal rectovaginal septum. So I've done the left side. I'm now gonna do the right side. And then sometimes we just have to mobilize, uh, mobilize bowel off the pelvic brim so we can really see where our ureter is and start by dissecting it out well above where our disease starts, especially when the entire posterior cul-de-sac is obliterated. Um, I'm a straight stick laparoscopist. I know really good robotic surgeons can make this look, uh, you know, really smooth and beautiful with the robot. But I just like using uh, a Maryland and uh, harmonic energy device, uh, which I feel gives us really good dissection for endometriosis. Um, there can be a lot of bleeding in endometriosis because the disease can be fibrotic. And so I find it really helpful, but it's just one way to do it. So with the ureters lateralized on both sides, a lot of times we'll enter the perirectal fat and try to separate it and delineate it from the fibrotic uterosacral ligament here. Here's my ureter. Sometimes the ovaries get in the way. If I'm ever removing an endometrioma at the same time, I'll just uh, tack the ovaries to the anterior abdominal wall so that they stay out of the way. In this case, they weren't too, too bad. Um, and then we use a lot of vasopressin. So uterus responds really, really well to vasopressin. The rectovaginal area responds really well to vasopressin. So we'll just inject it with a, a laparoscopic needle. And here I'm, I have opened up the perirectal areas, but still trying to find that rectovaginal septum uh, using um, fat as my friend. And we have a manipulator in the uterus lifting it up. I was also putting pressure on the back of it. I can see that's the manipulator in the back of the vagina. So I could see that, okay, the, the vagina is actually here and I can make my cut a little bit lower um, to let the, the rectum down. And our philosophy really is to separate the organs and restore the normal anatomy and then find the uh, endometriosis nodule, which is remaining here and here. And then uh, once they're separated, you can, you can fully dissect them. Here I am cutting out uh, some more of that uterosacral ligament. Again, you can see how close those, those ureters get, always keeping my hot blade away from the ureter and taking down the remainder of this lesion. A lot of times these uterosacral lesions will become contiguous with the, the bowel lesions. And so you wanna make sure that these are fully excised. So I'm gonna start from my uh, cut edge and take it down uh, to the rectal serosa. And then I'm gonna switch to my cold endoshears and basically do a shaving and what you'll see is almost just this like fibrotic rind that comes off. Here I'm doing this on the left side, making sure my fibrotic uterosacral ligament is removed so that I have really good access to removing all the disease and fully mobilizing the, the rectum here. Okay. So here is my um, endometriosis that I'm just shaving off of the serosa. A lot of the endometriosis is actually on the peritoneum, on that peritoneal reflection overlying the rectum. And you can almost see it kind of opening up here as I shave it off. So I'm gonna open that up and shave off the rest uh, and then just um, reinforce it and 
uh, I just use a, a 3 v lock uh, to close over the, the healthy tissue and, um, and then perform like a, a rigid uh, proctoscopy at the end with a bubble test. And, and these patients for us, again, it's not a full thickness lesion. This was just a, a very conservative shaving. So these patients do go home the same day and uh, they can eat and drink normally. We've studied our patients and on average for these types of surgeries, they do return normal bowel movements in about two to four days. You can see the uterine manipulator there moving and here's just the uh, bubble test at the end. And this patient did have, she had pretty bad uh, rectal pain with her cycles and, and that did resolve um, after this surgery. And she was also in her forties when she had this surgery. So the closer somebody is to menopause, the more likely they're gonna have a better long-term effect uh, when it comes to their surgical outcomes as opposed to somebody who's very young. So I'm gonna stop sharing that and share another video. Um, videos are always a, a, a good time to, to call out questions. So if you all have any, you know, please feel free. We do have one question from the chat as you're pulling this up, but just for some clarification, this is from Dr. Mark Solomon. Um, there is a mention that dealing with endometrial lesions above the sigmoid colon have a higher complication rate and might lead to fistulas. Um, but can you please elaborate or clarify if it was above or below? Sorry, I should have said below. Um, endometriosis lesions and nodules that are on the rectum or the rectal vaginal septum and the lower and lower that they go ha do have a higher risk of complications, including fistula. Uh, formation into the vagina. So that's where we try to be more conservative. Sorry if uh, I misspoke on that. Thank you so much. Yeah. So this was actually a procedure performed by my partner. I'll just show you the beginning. Let's see if we have an overall view. So this is a complete obliteration of the posterior cul-de-sac here. You can see that all the organs are stuck together. Um, and this patient actually had a very big left uterosacral nodule that was contiguous with a full thickness, um, basically uh, rectosigmoid nodule that was less than three centimeters. And so they used the dental floss uh, circular uh, stapler technique. I'm gonna skip through the hysterectomy part because this patient was not having organ conserving surgery. She was also undergoing a TLH BSO at the same time due to disease on all of those organs. But what you can see here is the uterus and the ovaries have been uh, completely disconnected except for the vaginal cups, the colpotomy here. And our remaining endometriosis is really right in this area here. So you're gonna watch the continued dissection in this area. So this is why we say like serial removal of the organs is not sufficient for treatment of endometriosis. Uh, we wanna make sure that we also remove all the disease if a patient is undergoing organ removal. So there's the left ureter, of course, there. And uh, oftentimes the sigmoid mesentery can be very densely uh, involved in these endometriosis lesions as well. These are the uterine vessels that are clipped at the origin. This is the in distal internal iliac and the medial umbilical ligament. And so to get off this nodule of endometriosis, uh, these vessels had to be cut at their origin. This vessel is going all the way from the parametrium over the ureter here, and then into the uterosacral ligament, uh, basically through the bowel mesentery. And then you can see this staining here on the colon, and that is the nodule right at the junction there. So what they're gonna do is, is completely remove uh, this entire endometriosis lesion. And we're always using that perirectal fat to our advantage. It does not tend to be as effective for us. Uh, it's probably much more effective in diseases that you all deal with, but for us, it's a, it's a really nice landmark um, for being able to dissect out endometriosis and know where we are. So this is the nodule on the left uterosacral ligament. This is going into the clean part of the rectovaginal septum. 
And again, these uterine manipulators that hold up the uterus for us uh, are really, really helpful. So we use things like a Pelosi, which is a reusable metal uterine manipulator that can go in and simply just hold the uterus straight up. Um, or something like a, a Rumi, um, which is a, a disposable option that can be placed. Um, and so we find those just really, really helpful. So now the, the rectum is separate from the rest of the nodule. The vicral suture is used to push the nodule into the circular stapler, uh, which is then closed. So I think this is a, a super cool technique um, and really nice for the right size nodule in the right location. And now that that portion is done, the remainder of the hysterectomy can be performed. This is what the Rumi co uter manipulator looks like. It's got a blue cup that goes around the cervix so you can delineate the borders of the cervix and the back of the vagina. And then the uh, vagina is closed. Uh, still a lot of debate versus single layer closure versus two layer closure. Uh, but in this case, we, we, and in all endometriosis, we wanna try to find the, the healthiest edges to put back together. And so sometimes that involves the bladder peritoneum. And then in this case, they did uh, an omental flap uh, between the um, colpotomy closure and the rectal excision, which I think makes a lot of sense again to prevent fistula formation. Okay, and that's the elemental flap. Well, I'll just show one other video. And then while, that, while you're pulling yeah. up the video, we have another question. Um, this is from Aretha. Does excision of an ovarian endometrioma eliminate the risk of ovarian cancer or do these patients require special surveillance? Yeah, great question. So we think that if the, because the risk of cancer is, is really associated with recurrence, if these patients are monitored and they don't have any recurrence of the endometrioma throughout their menstruating lives, then we do not think that they need uh, oophorectomy for risk reduction. So really good question. So this was a patient who actually presented with uh, pleural effusion. And when her pleural effusion, uh, uh, was tapped, it was found actually that she also had ascites and she had hemorrhagic ascites. And so this is something that you all might encounter as surgeons if a patient presents with ascites, but it's tapped and it's either really brown or hemorrhagic, then it can be related to endometriosis. And what's been shown in these patients is that uh, a total hysterectomy with oophorectomy is the recommended treatment. Um, so this was a patient who presented with ascites, we put her on Lupron, a GRNH agonist uh, for three months to reduce the ascites, which did work. She also had a fibroid here, but you can see her posterior cul-de-sac is so obliterated that it doesn't even look like she has separate organs. And it's really a, a miracle that she did not end up with a bowel obstruction. So in these cases, um, what we do for the, the total organ removal is really just circle the dragon. So I'm gonna leave the entire posterior part of the uterus uh, and the bowel stuck together until I have all of the pedicles delineated. And even her retroperitoneum was pretty fibrotic, even though she'd never had surgery before, um, probably because the ascites had been there for so long. So in these cases, we'll often uh, look for the distal internal iliac and, uh, and clip that. Again, just looking in here, really, really hard to find her retroperitoneal structures. Everything is, is very much pulled medially when it comes to her ureter and her, and her vessels. So here, what I'm looking for is the um, IP, the ovarian vessels, which will be in this lateral part here of the intact peritoneum. And then of course, looking for her ureter down here, which is pulled so medial, it's really along the, the mesenteric edge of the sigmoid colon there. Um, and so by looking for these adnexal pedicles and taking them first, 
it starts to mobilize the organs for me. So here you can see the ureter on the medial aspect and then the internal iliac is on the lateral aspect of this little window. And sometimes we do have to approach the pedicles this way. We typically prefer to approach them laterally so that we have a great view of the ureter. Um, however, sometimes that's just not, not feasible. So again, here's the ureter on the medial aspect. The one benefit of endo is that uh, if you're trying to dissect out the internal iliac, the ureter is usually pulled medially by the disease. This unfortunately was a case right after COVID where we had uh, supply chain shortages and I had to use an in inadequate clip applier. Um, here's her appendix completely stuck into this nodule of endometriosis under her uterus. And there's our, those are the fimbria of both of her fallopian tubes right there. So the appendix was densely adherent right into her fallopian tubes. And so I was just going to release this and then take everything all on block together. Um, and again, see, even when they're all obliterated, the appendices we deal with aren't too troublesome. So you can just easily tie them off and, and use an endo loop and say goodbye uh, to the cecum being in our way. So once all the lateral pedicles were obtained, uh, you can see the thing remaining is her uterus, both adnexus stuck, the appendix, and then the rectosigmoid colon. Here I'm using vasopressin, as again, even though the uh, vascular pedicles were taken, there's still a lot of fibrotic tissue in here, uh, and the vasopressin into the back of the uterus, into the adnexa, and even a little bit into the sigmoid mesentery can be really helpful for just maintaining visualization. They never bleed too much, but once you get blood on your pedicles and staining on your peritoneum, it can be really hard to continue your dissection. Here I'm making sure that the ureters are starting to be lateralized. Here's the appendix that I'm leaving stuck to the tubes, but dissecting off of the sigmoid colon here. Um, so that was a lot of fun. The fimbriae um, can bleed a lot, so proceed with caution uh, when you're pulling them off. And then continuing uh, using my perirectal fat as a guide to push the ureter away laterally and releasing all of this tissue um, off to the side. In a patient like this, it can be really hard to find uh, healthy tissue. But even in big cases like this, we could still do it laparoscopically. Uh, we know that is better for patients, particularly their, their fertility, um, and that patients who have endo uh, resected, even severe endo, if it's done by laparotomy, their fertility outcomes are much, much worse. Um, and that's likely because of scarring after the laparotomy. So I know we are coming toward the end of our time, so I'll just uh, skip to the end so that you can see what it looked like. Kind of looked like a bomb went off, but you can see how far up her endometriosis disease went above uh, both pelvic brims here. So that's the vaginal cuff that was closed, um, the ureters, you, can, you can't even see her left one, and then the rectosigmoid area. Okay. Well, thank you so Other much. Questions. For that. We yeah, do have a couple more questions if you have a few more minutes. Sure. Um, uh, First question, so how, I guess, how often do you use your ureteral stents for these complex pelvic cases? Yeah, great question. I think the consensus among my partners is we don't love ureteral stents because we really depend on the fasciculation and the movement to guide us in the anatomy. So if a patient already has hydronephrosis from a ureteral blockage, we'll, and we know there's an extensive dissection there, we'll use them. Um, but other than that, we don't find it helpful for delineate, delineating our anatomy. Okay. And could you discuss medical management in more detail? Um, there's a couple follow-up questions here. So in which order would you try the various medical options and how many lines of therapy before medical options are considered exhausted? Um, yeah. We, uh, another question we had that kind of go along with this is if specifically for chronic pelvic pain too, how are you deciding what you're starting with like after hormonal therapy? Yeah, well, unfortunately, hormonal therapy is still the mainstay of our, of our medical management for endometriosis. 
So um, for patients who are healthy, who have no limitations to what they can take, we'll typically start with combined oral contraceptive simply because it also provides contraception for patients. It's also been shown to be really helpful for patients with endometrioma in regards to preventing recurrence. And that's probably because the combined pills with estrogen and progestins do a better job of preventing ovulation than progestins alone. Um, so there's combined oral pills, estrogen and progestin, Progestins, there's progestin alone for patients who can't take estrogen, which again is most patients, um, which is uh, most patients are candidate for progestins unless they have breast cancer. And that comes in a uh, form of an oral pill. It also comes in the form of the hormone emitting IUD, and it also comes in an arm implant that lasts for several years. So we try to be patient centered in what they want. Um, some of those convey contraception and some of those do not. And then the last options are things like the GRNH agonists or antagonists, which are available in shot and pill form. Um, and these can be really helpful for some patients, but they're only FDA approved for about two years because they do put patients into menopause and they are associated with significant bone density loss and also car uh, cardiac effects. Um, so we exhaust our medical options very quickly. <laughs> and then we are left with, you know, surgery, finding some kind of medical option they can tolerate to prevent progression or uh, recurrence, and then using options for management of pain kind of all together. Awesome. A um, couple more. What post-operative surveillance strategy would you recommend after colon resection for endometriosis? Yeah. Um, I... You know, I wouldn't say that we have any any um, well defined way to survey these people like you would with cancer. And I would say it's the same thing for all endometriosis. We try to be more symptom based. Um, so for patients who might have a big excision, we'll often put them on some kind of medical management, some kind of hormonal suppression. We'll often give them some kind of pain management if needed, and we'll just continue to watch their symptoms over time. And the truth is, if they do have recurrence of endometriosis, if it's not an ovarian endometrioma and they're not symptomatic from it, it doesn't have to be treated. And then at the time of menopause, the thought is that most endometriosis essentially goes dormant and no longer continues to cause a, a problem for patients. So, um, so we're really trying to, you know, we treat it as a chronic disease, kind of put a Band-Aid on it for several decades and then, you know, see how far we can get. For patients who do have recurrent symptoms, we'll start the entire process over. So maybe they'll get a colonoscopy again, they'll get another MRI to see if they actually do have recurrent disease, or maybe you do all those studies and they don't have any visible recurrent disease, but they might have something microscopic and then we'll still you know, wanna be treating them with the same uh, medical options. Okay, I actually had this question also, but this is also from the chat. So for some of our, colon resections for benign disease, we do transvaginal extractions. Um, yeah. Would you recommend omental flaps for all of the transvaginal extractions if we make the colpotomy? Yeah, we, I love transvaginal extraction. I think it's a, it's a great thing. Um, I, we do not really recommend omental flaps for transvaginal extraction over colpotomies if the uterus or the cervix is still present because we think there's still enough structure from the cervix and the uterosacral ligaments in particular that help prevent fistula formation. Um, so we're actually quite liberal, even when we do tissue extraction through a colpotomy, we're quite, quite liberal with uh, you know, post-op restrictions for patients, much more so than patients who undergo full hysterectomy with a full colpotomy and no um, organ remaining in place. Okay, and then uh what point do you call the colorectal surgeon for intraoperative consults or preoperatively? Yeah, we try to do we try to do a good preop workup so there's not surprises. We also don't want patients to be surprised. We want to be good colleagues. So um, I'll typically we'll work with the colorectal surgeon if we think a segmental resection is indicated. So a large nodule or multi multifocal disease or nodules that are higher up, which we've diagnosed based on the MRI, and then most shaving and some small disc excisions we'll do ourselves. And then. Thank you. There's one more question. Is um, when do, when is Lupron used as part of the algorithm for medical management? 
Yeah, so Lupron's a, a GRNH agonist um, that I mentioned is only FDA approved for two years. So while we can use it for medical management, we typically will just use it on the short term because of the you know long term health effects. Um, so you know, uh, yes, you can use it, but unfortunately, it's limited for such a long term disease. Okay, and I think that's it, and we are a little over time. Um, thank you so much for being with us today. Your talk was wonderful and relevant for us, and we really appreciate it. Um, I know the chat was also very active, which is awesome to see everybody participating. Um, so thank you again. I hope you all have a good night, and then we continue to tune in. Um, <laughs> our email to serve if you haven't already, and then you'll have all of the information for upcoming weeks. Thanks so much. And I'm happy to share my contact info. If you all have any questions, happy to help out. So awesome. thanks Thank for being you here. Thank you so much. Have a